And uh, the first item is the uh, approval of the minutes from uh, July 2nd. I'll make a motion for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Public comment. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joe Scafanti, and I live in the city of Vero Beach. About a year, I'll be very brief, and thank you for taking care of this matter post haste, as you promised me before the meeting. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I came before this group and asked you, I uh, told you that I'd like to see an analysis and an evaluation of the uh, money, uh, how our money is being managed. And I believe at the time, this is a stretch, but I think it was about $141 million. And I don't remember exactly where that money was and who, in what category it was, but I know that it was invested. And I wondered if you have done that. Have you analyzed and evaluated the performance of the money manager or managers? And as in Mayor Koch, how are we doing? How, are, how did they do? Uh, Cindy, you want to address that because uh, one of the things that is an issue is the uh, interest earned for the, uh, for the city. But uh, there's also the difference between money that's invested uh, for operations as opposed money that's in trust funds, like the pensions and so forth. But, Senator, do you want to address? Uh, uh, let me, may I just say, I would prefer to have an evaluation in writing that somebody, I don't care who does it, I'd like a hard copy, and when that's available, I is one available now? We, um... This is a little premature because um, we I'm, we actually have this item on later in the agenda, but I, I know oh, you probably really? don't want to you probably I'm, don't want to stay for that. No. Um, but uh, Mr. Gore is correct. You know, there's there's really two sets of funds being managed. One of them, probably the the most of the money, is in the pension funds. And um, just as a highlight for what we're going to be talking about later in the agenda, um, we have reconstituted the um, General Employee Pension Board. We have had a meeting with our investment advisor and done a fairly detailed asset allocation review. Where which is here, um, okay. and towards with an eye towards um, relooking our investment policy to make sure it's still in line with our goals in the pension plan. So I was planning after we talk about it later to make a copy of this available to the finance commission. I'd be happy to make a copy available to you as well. I, I want to be specific. What I want is your opinion or somebody's opinion that works for the city of Vero Beach or this. Account, I, it's what do you what your group call commission. This Fine, commission. This commission. I want to say, uh, rate this, rate the performance of this with respect to the standard employees, 500 of the Dow Industrial Average, or something like that. It's pretty straightforward what I want, uh, and I'd like to. The reason why I am here, I guess, is because uh, recently the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And the rest of the market pretty much hit an all-time high. And I'd like to know in writing how, how the, what the performance is of the people that are handling uh, the city's money, how it relates to that. And because years ago, and I, I didn't want to be this long, it, that years ago we suffered severe losses and the taxpayers are responsible, are, are uh, exposed to that loss, not the pensioners. So I, I think you know what I want. So when can, uh, not when, but can, would you do something along those lines? Somebody? Well, actually the report, and, and I do provide these on a quarterly basis to the Finance Commission, these reports that we get from our investment advisor do do benchmark all the individual funds against the standard and poor and you know they well, drill, drill down to the individual fund level um, you know benchmark them against other indicators in the market um, and have detailed descriptions of the funds and how their asset how their earnings performance compares to other standard benchmarks in the industry so this may be what you're looking for well, in terms of my it, I'd rather have somebody from the city of Vero Beach or the Commission uh, write a two, one paragraph comment about the performance and evaluation of these people. That, and also, I, good thing I was here, stayed this long, I'd like to know what it costs us, 
how much money per year are, does it cost us to have our money managed? And, and again, that is a part of That's the agenda it. item for later on. Um, it's yeah. in here and it's also in the audited financial statements. But yeah, we had planned actually to have a fairly, a little bit of a detailed discussion about that very thing uh, today. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't stop. I unfortunately can't say. So, um, so I certainly can provide a copy of this for you. Um, in terms of, of my opinion, um, I found an article recently that I'd be happy to share with the Finance Commission and with you that was a fairly good, I think, Bloomberg analysis of how public pension funds um, are recovering and how they've been performing. Right. And if you look at, at the performance analysis of our funds against some of those benchmarks as well, we're right in line with where earnings have been. We had a 17% return last year. Um, our 10-year uh, earnings are back up over 7%, um, which is starting to be more in line with the investment um, assumptions we're making in our actuarial valuation. So, you know, I feel comfortable that, that we're trending in the right direction in the industry as a whole and also with with these reports, but certainly we can have more conversation about that at, I hope at some point. This is the last question. Sure. Is the fund at, as high as it's ever been? Um, I mean, that's in the, terms I, of raw, in, raw I, dollars. Pardon, in terms of value, dollars. But probably not, only because okay. although we're starting to see good investment returns, if you look, um, actually, if you look in the CAFR, there's a 10-year history of the um, market value of the fund. So you can see there, you know, basically in 2008 right, how right. it dropped and how it's begun to rebuild. But um, again, um, in it's the not audit, at an all-time high, though. I don't believe it is. Um, I can certainly pull the audited financial statements and look at that history. It's about a 10-year history of the value of the fund. Can you, without too much effort, uh, can you give something to the uh, city clerk so that I can come down and pick it up? I will put together um, a package of, of this and yeah, without, the relevant I pages of the cash. I don't want you to spend a lot of time. You can't. Yeah. If it's going to take time, if you have this information already available, that's no problem. These are things that already I'm not exist. not trying to burden anybody, okay? No, I appreciate it. These are things that already exist, and I'll just put together I'm, copies for you. Yeah. I'm glad you're addressing the issue today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a, um, a couple of issues I wanted to present, but first I would like to ask uh, uh, Jim to uh, give us an update on the meeting last Friday with uh, FPL and FMPA, I believe. And in the package of the uh, uh, commissioners is the letter that was written from the president of uh, uh, FPL to uh, the CEO of FMPA outlining some direction. Uh, if you could, wouldn't mind addressing that in just a quick overview of the meeting, Jim. I will do that. All four parties were actually at the meeting, OUC, FPL, ourselves, and uh, FMPA. We met at the FMPA offices. The uh, letter from the president of FPNL was presented to FMPA on Monday, uh, in which the president and the executive director for FMPA met that evening to discuss issues. And uh, the letter, as outlined, and the discussion that took place last Friday really addressed three major concerns. And in people sometimes we get tangled up because it's taking us so long, but trust me, in negotiations, to figure out what the other party needs sometimes takes time. And so for the last two years, we really have been trying to find out what is the common denominator that we can put forth to make this deal go. And we identified three from our side, and this is based on our discussions with FMPA. One is that they have uh, made an offer to purchase some nuclear power out of the Southern Company in Georgia. They have offered that to their member cities. And when they made that proposal, the caveat was is that they would have to acquire some type of transmission in order to get that down. We've only got two, maybe three pipelines that come into our peninsula from the north in order to provide power. So transmission was an issue, and it was an issue that dates back about a year or two with the FMPA. So we tried to identify that, and we did. And part of the proposal from FPNL was to give access. They actually own a transmission rights in Georgia, and this would help FMPA acquire that transmission right at a reasonable price in order to bring that power back down into uh, the state of Florida. The second thing is, is uh, 
a few months ago, uh, one of the things that the uh, attorney for FMPA said is that, and we got all wrapped around the axle because there was some allegation that OUC wouldn't have entered this conversation except that the Turkey Point uh, transaction was taking place, which is not accurate. We can find no relationship between OUC signing the deal with FPNL because of Turkey Point. But that being said, FMPA showed an interest in acquiring a portion of the Turkey Point 5 and 6 in order, again, to diversify their fuel mix and have access to more nuclear power. Again, the president of FMP FPL put that in his letter as an access point in order to uh, give them diversified fuel base on future plants in coming online in the peninsula. The third thing is, is the power supply agreement. In order to try to, and we've been fighting over the IRS and how that letter would be written and the terms and conditions that would be presented to the IRS in order to get a private letter ruling. And that was getting all bogged down in a quagmire. So the way that you get around that is you actually sell the power supply to another nonprofit municipal or qualifying agency. FMPA happens to be a qualifying agency. And so in the letter it said that uh, we would like to sell the power or have FMPA buy the power, and they can sell it on their own market however they want to do it. That gets us around the IRS. It also gets us around the issue of is it market price, is it not market price, which was another little issue that we were f uh, facing. So what FPL said is that we understand there will be an additional cost to this, and they left in there, we will negotiate a price for you taking that power supply. So we, we feel very comfortable that uh, we have addressed the three issues that have come out over the last couple of years as concerns in our negotiations. Got a very positive read. Uh, for the first time, the executive director of FMPA sat in on the discussions, and Nick Giriello, and I knew him back when I was on FMPA 20 years ago, is a very reasonable and a good guy. The other thing is, is he's not an attorney, and a lot of times you get wrapped up in the legal issues and you lose sight, you know, the can't see the forest for the trees type of thing. He's an engineer, so he can evaluate the values of what is being offered as a complete package. So we think that we have a, a good proposal that has been put forth. Uh, there has been some discussion, is this going to affect the city's contract and what the referendum was on, and the answer to that question is no. The, the business part of our contract really remains the same. That's not to say that, for example, uh, if FMPA says that they want an, uh, an additional $10 million to take that power supply agreement, we probably will escalate in the contribution from FPNL to the city of Vero Beach, and we would contribute that since it's our power being purchased by FMPA. So it may change some of the numbers somewhat, but the bottom line as to what the city would have would not be changed. So it does not change any substantially any of the business uh, provisions of the contract. Uh, there are still a lot of things to be uh, negotiated. One is the price of the transmission and how much access FMPA will have. Uh, FPNL uh, has made, uh, they're doing their engineering feasibility. FMPA is doing their engineering feasibility to see what the market bears here i.e. what cities would actually buy through FMPA, and then uh, how to price that uh, that uh, that transmission. Uh, the uh, buy-in to uh, Turkey Point should be relatively simple. It's going to be under the similar terms and conditions as the OUC contract, which is very favorable because you've got to understand OUC has a lot of other connections and contracts with FPNL interconnects, and so that that's a pretty favorable way of approaching it. And of course, the blank space in the letter, we, we will have to negotiate that number and, and try to get down into the weeds and, and how to get that taken care of. But I think we've opened up a real avenue of access in order to be able to sit down and, and try to get this deal done. Commissioners? Um, are most of the FMPA members located in the northern part of the state? I guess my question is, why are we going to southern Georgia to get power rather than south Florida? 
the, the real key is is the fuel. Uh, that is one of the newer uh, nuclear plants that will give access, and their pricing is right. Georgia, the Southern Company, is suffering from the same thing we all are: uh, high demand, high supply, low demand, and so therefore their pricing's right. The proposal that is being discussed with FMPA and the Southern Company is that they will not have the ownership similar to our contracts with Stanton where we're responsible for the overhead cost. It would be independent, it would be a direct purchase power uh, supply, which is a better pricing than what we have. And so it is access to a power that is available, that is nuclear power. Okay. Then a second question, how are we coming along on the I guess the the okay from each individual member, is that still part of the equation or is that going to be looked at collectively by one board? Well, the answer to that question is we have not finished those discussions. Uh, FMPA and in talking to their executive director has said, if we come to an agreement at the table, he says we're making too big of an issue out of that. So... That opens the door that we have opportunities for further discussion, and we feel comfortable that he says that. Now, the key is is that everybody's sitting around the table. That includes OUC, just you know, to make sure, because there's still going to be a, a partner in this because the power supply agreement that we have with OUC will also transfer under this scenario to FMPA. So there's going to be a power supply agreement between OUC and FMPA, similar in nature to what they had with FPNL, and so that transaction is going to be another negotiated uh, power supply agreement. But it, it it really is it's going to be a total package, and part of that package is is how we address the cities. But again, with Nick telling us that if we can come to an agreement with the four parties sitting at the table, he feels very comfortable we can make that other happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Right. Uh, especially for the public, to begin to understand when you say it's complex, just as you've explained, indeed, it is Terrible. It's a Gordian knot that has to be worked out. It's being negotiated, moving forward, so uh, we just have to wait to see how these negotiations come out. But I appreciate the update. It, not a problem. It, 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 you know, every challenge is there, and there are multiples of those, and you have to take them uh, one at a time. And one of the other little criticisms that we have heard uh, from folks is, why didn't you start with FMPA as opposed to uh, OUC and working out the contract? And that's because we needed a document in order to take the FMPA to get us into this type of discussions and negotiations. If we did not have a document that we were discussing, we would still be all over the board and would not know how to make that, that final decision. I would like to just give a, uh, a quick overview. I'll, I'll stand up to the machine. It'll, it'll show up here, right, uh, Tammy? Uh, it's, a, it's a handwritten. There's several handwritten, but... Uh, What, what I'm going to address is the uh, uh, police pension and what has happened since 2007. This is independent of the discussion we're going to have later that's going to be addressing uh, primarily the general fund. But uh, this is just to put it in perspective and then when we go into the budget, I want to address some issues surrounding the police department. As you can see, the uh, staff in 2007, this is from the CAFRA, were 89. Uh, as of uh, uh, the retirement of uh, the captain, it'll be 73 uh, before the end of this year. Uh, the budget in 07 was 7.4 million. Uh, <coughs> last year, <coughs> 2013, from the budget book is 6. Dot eight million, which is a six hundred thousand dollar difference. <laughs> but what is key is going down and looking where it says police, and this is the police pension. The contribution by the city 
by the city in 2007 was 220,000 and in 2012-13 it's 859 there's a 639 thousand dollar difference in five years and part of that as you can see the state contribution went down by a hundred and six thousand uh, and what was the cause and uh, Mr. Gafasi brought this up we all know about it <coughs> that it was a hundred and two percent funded in 2007 and it's 79 percent funded today uh, also that's the police part of the pension uh, the, the, the officers the sworn officers there's also a peace part of the general fund and uh, uh, pension and that went up from uh, uh, 95 to 183,000 uh, with an $88,000 difference the bottom line then is that the percent funding again went from 76 percent to 59 percent now 60 percent is generally accepted as a crucial threshold if you're below 60 percent in the funding of your pension plan without getting into any uh, uh, discussion but it is it is a uh, uh, recognized by the rating agencies uh, as a threshold trigger when you go below 60 percent I think there's some better news coming at us uh, going forward but that's how it stands as of today well <clears throat> what's my point my point is is that in 2007 we had three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in pension costs in 2012 it's a million forty two a seven hundred and twenty seven thousand dollar difference that the chief and the chiefs and uh, uh, Jim and his staff had no control over I mean that was the result of what the uh, investment was now uh, I also took a look at hospitalization which <clears throat> went up another fifty thousand so the bottom line I'm just making the point is that uh, uh, it looks like the seven hundred and seventy seven thousand uh, dollar push from the pension and the hospitalization in five years so even though looking at a, a, a reduction in the total budget by six hundred thousand there was a seven hundred and seventy seven thousand push from the uh, from the benefits uh, just to, again perspective the property taxes receipts in 2007 were 5.7 million and 4.2 million uh, today again that gets back to the property evaluation for the most part but the millage in fact was reduced from 2.142 to 2033 so I just wanted to uh, put that in perspective as we go forward because I'd like to speak about the uh, uh, the police budget uh, uh, when we talk about the budget itself the questions now, now this is just the pension funds now is it in, does it include does it include uh, the what do you call it OPE or does not include that either that's so that's the pension fund alone. Just the pension fund. It's not the OPD or OPD. Exactly OPD. right. That's, oh, that's another forty million outs, outside of the yeah, and, and, question and, here, right? And, and that right. The, the pension is split, as you know, between the, the general fund and the uh, uh, and the police. But the uh, OPE and the hospitalization are for all employees. But yeah, you're right. I mean, because when I looked, uh, I think when I looked at the balance sheet, there had been an addition to the balance sheet liabilities of around thirteen million dollars for the last three years. It was a, it was a, 
one-year adjustment that had to be made to catch the books up, correct? Man. And the OPEP thing is slightly different. Um, you know, with with the pension fund, what we're required to do is every year we have an actuarial valuation. Our actuary makes the determination of what our annual required contribution right. is, including our amortization of that unfunded liability, and we make that dollar contribution. With OPEB, you know, the actuarial valuation says, in theory, all things remaining unchanged, you have this outstanding liability. But what we do in reality is we pay every year whatever that year's required contribution is by the city towards that year's retirement benefits. And so when you account for it on the books, the the money that flows out of the city toward the unfunded liability on the pension is real money. We put cash right. against that every year, whereas that OPEB liability exists as a, a book a, as a book entry. But every year, what we do is just make the city's portion of the retiree health benefit contribution. And there's a line item in every fund, in the non-departmental in every fund, for that contribution um, based on where people were when they retired. It's attributed to that particular fund as being you know a retiree expense. So yeah, it's just shows up a pure liability mm-hmm. on the books, the balance mm-hmm. sheet. That's it, what does. it does. And, and I will tell you, you know, we've talked about this briefly before, but in a couple of years, the way that pension fund accounting is done per the GASB is going to change. And the way it works now is as long as the city continues to make annually the full amount of its annual required contribution, we do not have to reflect that unfunded pension liability on our books because right. we're making our required payments toward that liability every year. GASB is going to, I think it, it kicks in for us for the fiscal year ending fourteen fifteen, disconnect um, the book entries from the funding of a pension plan and require us to book the entire Unfunded liability in our pension plan as a liability on on the books. And that's about forty five million in us. About forty at. million at this point. Now, better 40, news 41, is coming. It will be million. our funding percentage should be good with this year's CAF or that you know we start preparing in a month or so. But um, and then the decisions about funding. You, you know, we still will have an actuarial required contribution every year, right. and we will still certainly budget to make that contribution. But we'll no longer get credit, if you will, for doing that as part of our financial statements. We'll have to actually show the entire unfunded liability. So, and some changes are coming on OPEB as well. Yeah. Cindy, I, I think you bring out a point in that the way you account for pensions has changed since this 2007. It did in the private sector too. And it resulted that a lot of businesses suddenly looked in trouble because the calculations were done differently. It didn't mean the situation had really changed. It's just the way that you were accounting for it. And the OPEB thing for certainly, yeah, that, that has changed a bunch since the OPEB. When was that? Probably about 08, but yes, we had to start so reflecting that on the books. The figure mm-hmm. would not have incorporated the changes that were required and how you account for it. And like I said, it was there all along. It just wasn't being re- recorded. Mm-hmm. And I, I think maybe one of the things you're trying to point out, even though we have fewer employees, we're having higher expenses. And, and I think one of the things that can create that, too, is the age of the employees maybe you're losing because the older your workforce, the, the higher your pension expense becomes. And if your investments can't make up that gap, you know, you're going to have to put more in. But if the pool of people are older, the young people are pulling out, then, then that can exacerbate the situation, yeah. You know. In terms of the liabilities yeah. and the unfunded amount in the fund, absolutely. There's less time to provide um, the funding for people who are near retirement. Right, but in terms of again of, of real cash money, um, the the contribution that the city has had to make to the police pension plan has indeed gone up by over six hundred thousand dollars since two thousand seven. In order for us to make our arc, our annual required contribution, because they suffered the same problem everybody did in two thousand eight and kind of went upside down. So, um, you know, it certainly is a situation that that. Um, but as we, but, with. but as we reduce the employee base vis-a-vis the the retired community and that means functionally uh, the cost of maintaining the retirement program will have to go up per employee I mean I mean longer run I mean just it's a mathematical equation now (laughs) it's you know and 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 again we're 
all things keep leading back to this uh, item 7D. I but, know, you know, I, the police, and I can't, and I'm looking forward to it. But the police pension board, I think, has done an excellent job over the last couple of years um, of working with their actuary to begin to gently revise some of their actuarial assumptions so that they don't have a huge swing in any given year, but they're slowly, like a quarter percent a year, dialing back their investment return assumption, trying to, to bring this back to a place where the funding percentage is, is realistic and, and also, in their opinion, realistically reflects what they're going to need in order to keep that a viable fund. So they've been paying some attention to it. But it, it you know they had a good year like we did last year, um, but they have the same five-year smoothing, so it's going to take a, a little bit of time for that the good news from last year to kick in and reduce that contribution. But I would suspect for both them and for us, the actual contribution for this coming fiscal year should start to go back in the other direction as the health of these funds improves. And once 2008 gets off the board, which hopefully will happen this year. It's already done, yeah. Yeah. And so our numbers will, will, should start looking better because we started progressing at that point. I think when our, our pension people were here, they brought out an interesting point in that, you know, when you, you do stop a plan, um, then sometimes you have to increase the funding. Uh, they were saying we would have to maybe get less aggressive with the investments, and you might see that you'd have to put more money in. I think I, I heard that. And, and two, when you're not bringing in new employees who might be younger when you've discontinued the plan, sometimes those younger people are making contributions and paying for the older people. You know, we have that in our society in a lot of places. And if you stop the inflow of new people in the plan, you know, there aren't as many people to, to pay who are not using the plan or not close to retirement. And, and you're absolutely right about both of those points. Um, the first one is that when you freeze the plan, from an actuarial standpoint, since it's no longer a robust plan, you have to change your amortization assumptions. And the second thing is, yes, once it, we freeze this plan, we do have to go back and relook our investment mix because now you have no new money coming into that fund at all. You only have expenses and investments, and you have a, a tail out period that it has to cover. So, yes, we will have to relook the investment mix. Mr. Chairman, when you did this, can you, is the population base within 012 and 013 about the same, you know, between the added, the employees and the retired population? Well, no, I was just looking, just in the place. I mean, actually, the, uh, I mean, is, one, is the population the base? The population is on, on, you know, the liability population base. Oh. You mean both the uh, retired as well as the active? Yeah, if you added them all up, would it be? I, 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 I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking. No, no. I, I looked at it, and in fact, uh, it's in the CAFRA, mm -hmm. uh, and it does show. Actually, it's more concerning, and I, I know you wanted to get into this. It's more concerning on the general fund, no, it is. where there are more. You probably saw that. There's right. probably more after the uh, VBE gets sold. Mm -hmm. There's going to be more uh, retirees than there are. Uh, Population base going to shift population. against us, right? But, but there is there is a number in the. I'm uh, laughing because I'm thinking maybe we should just move item D up and just go ahead and have at that conversation. But and there is a number in the CAFR um, for all of the uh, the pension plans um, that shows the uh, the population. For instance, in police officers, including the current retirees and beneficiaries, the people in the drop, and the the people that are active participants. And it, I don't have the 2007 CAFR with me, so I don't don't know what it looked like in that particular. I'll do a better year. job of reviewing it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. It, at, right now, just though at the end of 2012, there were 39, uh, this is the police, uh, 39 retirees and beneficiaries receiving benefits, uh, four drop participants, two people that had terminated but had deferred their benefits till later, and 48 uh, active participants in the plan. So you're looking at a mix of you know, well over half of what's in the plan is active participants. Um, the general employee plan sits about the same place. It's 783 total with 300 um, beneficiaries, 95 deferred, and 380 that are currently in the plan. Um, so that's a pretty good ratio. Yeah. Two to one if we get hold of that. Yeah, we're going to lose 100. I know. The, the, yeah. other, the only other thing about the police numbers, and this is something I think that Jim brought out in our last budget workshop, when we first came on board, they had this con kind of a confusing thing in the budget where they had this concept called budgeted positions that were f frozen but not budgeted but authorized or something. So the, the position count in the budget and in the CAFR showed 10 more positions 
than were actually budgeted for. So we did away with that because, you know, in our opinion, if you don't budget for the position, then it's not a real position. You can call it frozen, unfunded, on whatever you want to, but if it's not in the budget, then it's not a position. So right. that number from 2007 may have at that point included the 10 frozen but unbudgeted. So no, at I, some point they, excuse me, at some point they went away, but they it looked like a big 10-person drop from one year to the next. In reality, it wasn't. It wasn't. Real, you know, I spoke with uh, uh, Chief Curry on these numbers to make sure I wasn't uh, uh, that I was on on base and he said that uh, he believed that the uh, 89 number was the correct number yeah. I, yeah. we we footnoted it um, I believe at one point in the CAFR to make it clear or, or we footnoted it actually in the back of the budget to show the year that it included the 10 that weren't real and why they dropped off in the following year so I beat up I beat up on the chief of police a little bit on the <laughs> and he, he took it well, uh, but I really did say to him, and uh, uh, as a function of the city, he's too high a ratio of money going to the police department. And in my humble opinion, we couldn't really solve the long-term problems without significantly impacting the police department. And uh, I laid out the ratios too. And he made a point, and I think Jim supported that, that in reality, the last couple of years, the police department has done a better job of getting man hours under control and getting their overtime under control. And it showed up this year in the budget. So, I mean, I saw the overtime go down rather, rather appreciably. So they do seem to be making headway. Uh, but uh, the big line on it is still going to be the police department. Well, another one of the issues, and you're right, we negotiated the uh, overtime issues out of the contract, which really helped us, and w I think it's going to help us even greater into the future. The other is is the uh, realignment of our middle management, if you want to call from the captain down middle right. management, and with the captain retiring that we just had, and eventually we will be down with those positions, and those will go back into the road patrol, which should help us overall. So the long-term strategy in the police department, I think, is very strong and is very good. We also have a police chief in place right now that understands budgeting. That's not to say that he's not going to be in here crying for more police officers whenever he feels like we need more police officers, but at the same time, it, I, I think he understands how the dollars are spent. Uh, he and Cindy have spent an awful lot of time in his first year as chief, and uh, I think he now, for a police chief, believe it or not, them understanding budgets is a foreign nation, but uh, I think we very fortunately in Vero Beach have one that does understand budgets and understands the routine that's going to take place as we make these reductions. And, and the number of officers, Peter, going back to years and Chief Curry also showed me some of those numbers of back in the 06, 07 time frame. A lot of those officers, some of those officers, I won't say a lot, some of those officers were in the higher command. I mean, they had like three captains and they had all kinds of lieutenants. And, and assistant and, chief. and Yeah. And so you had an awful lot of the higher command that we have sort of whittled out. I mean, we no longer have an assistant chief. We're down to one captain. And, and eventually we'll have the lieutenants under control and the sergeants will be doing most of that, that work. But still, when you look at his budget, and I did it very carefully, he only had about 10% of his total budget available for non-payroll related items. So, I mean, you know, when you looked at his training facilities and his ability to keep his cars moving and his gas running, it was pretty thin. Uh, there, there very is, thin. Yeah, there is no question about it. And it is a very skilled and a qualifying type of department. Yeah. And by saying that, you just can't take any Tom, Dick, or Harry and put him in a police department. He's got to undergo a lot of test and background in order that when we issue him a weapon that or her, that uh, we know who it is that we're, we're doing that for. So that average price per person goes up. Also being quasi-military, to try to attract those folks who are going to be qualified, you've got to give them a vision that one of these days I can become a general. And that's becoming very challenging as you're eliminating those management positions. And so that'll be something we will have to redefine the folks that are going to be working for us. We may get ourselves in a position that a 10-year tenure with the city of Vero Beach and the police department is a relatively long tenure. 
Or you could be good trading ground for another city. Absolutely. Unfortunately, that's I mean. and that's that's the longer term issue. Is where yeah, and that, we and end that, up being a graduate school for yeah. other police departments. And, that, and that, yeah. that's what I mean. I mean that right. and that that yeah. becomes when the people start learning the real community and ins and outs. We may be challenged that those folks will move. I mean, just in the last few months, we've lost two or three officers to Martin and Port St. Lucie. Uh, we have a guy that's going up to Jacksonville Beach. Uh, he's going with his wife's got a n new position. It wasn't because of this, but at, at the same time, if you look at those average salaries, where we've held ours in a, a static position for the last four years, other departments are going up. I.e., the tax increase for the sheriff's department. It's not just for the sheriff's department. I take that back, Sheriff Lord, Lord. But uh, it, the tax increase allowing for compensation changes in the sheriff's department will make that that Spread issue different. with us as as a challenge. And Fort Pierce is increasing uh, their. Uh payments as and well. Sebastian. So yeah. it's, uh, I, and, and one of these days, once once we have convinced the community we're right-sized, I think we will get ourselves in that position as well. Well, thank you. I, uh, just for the public, uh, uh, this commission uh, opens up to the public at any point rather than just holding it to the uh, to the uh, agenda. Uh, new business? Old business. The only thing I was, uh, Jim, I was talking about the utility. How are we coming on the, uh, the land question? Substation? What's that? Are you talking about the substation? Yes, the substation. We make it in headway there. Yes, we are. We've had uh, several meetings. We have a developer that's very interested. We are proceeding with the rezoning of the site that would become the city property if this exchange takes place. It'll be on the agenda for the third this next Tuesday, in which we have to rezone that site in order for a substation to be developed. Uh, we are negotiating. We, I guess I throw we in there because it seems like I'm always at the table with these folks, but it's really between the developer and FPNL as to what is the differential in cost of locating from what we have negotiated to this other site. And uh, there is a dollar exchange. FPL expects to be reimbursed at some point for the engineering requirements of moving to the other site. Fortunately for us, we've been able to use our electric department to show the advantages, and, and there are, in my opinion, advantages to the new site because they have double access from both uh, the e, uh, the north and south side of that. And so site. the two sites that we're putting together. That's correct. Correct. And and the distribution banks that were also of a critical nature, where at our at the site that we were trading, they were just right off site. These are going to be a little bit farther down, but we've been able to identify three of the four uh, distribution banks being very, very close, which should even reduce it more. So we're, we're, we're having some very good conversations. The um, rezoning is going to tell a lot. Uh, both of those parties, FPNL and the developers, have been through rezonings before, and they know how people sometimes get all excited <laughs> and come out on these things. And, yeah. and we could not guarantee a rezoning would take uh, effect because I can't presuppose what the city council may do in the, the discussions of public. That's a positive improvement if we get that done. Yeah. Yes, it is. That's and and I think all parties know that yeah. that, that would be a very good, a very That's important very positive. Step. Scott's leaving. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, Finance directors matters, as if you haven't been <laughs> directing already. <laughs> well, the, the first thing we have on the agenda, and we sort of started this a little bit, is to have a look at the um, proposed 1314 operating budget. Um, we have our first public hearing uh, on September the 3rd, next Tuesday at 5, 10 p.m. That will be the first time that the, um, or the second time the council does an, makes an official formal action with regard to setting millage and adopting a budget. And then the final public hearing, their last opportunity to uh, set a millage and adopt a budget is on September the 17th, also at 5, 10 p.m. Mm. We, um, 
out. I think you had a copy of the August 13th package, and we maybe discussed that briefly. But what I want to do quickly, in case um, you've actually had summer vacations and had a life for the last few months and haven't stayed on top of all the workshops and meetings, um, is recap where we've, where we've gotten to since we started this back in May. Um, one of the major things that we did after the May workshops was do away with the assumption that we would be selling the electricity, um, the electric utility during the coming fiscal year and went back to a full year's budget. We um, have restored some positions and most notably uh, the dispatch positions. Um, we did away with the notion that we would contract that out and restored those positions as in-house positions to the police department. And in our workshop last week, a uh, week before last, we put back the animal control officer position as well. Um, and we've restored a position to the recreation department and then as of the last workshop restored a position to the city clerk's office. Where we sit right now at the bottom line is a reduction of 28 positions citywide. And attached to the memo that I gave you that recapped the latest round of changes, you should see a uh, staffing level comparison between last fiscal year and this fiscal year um, with the proposed budget we have in front of us now. Most of those reductions have come in the general fund. Um, we're going from 202.5 positions in 12-13 to a proposed 185. 5.5 in 1314 in the general fund. And then there are some uh, reductions in water and sewer as we continue the optimization implementation in water and sewer. And then a few more sprinkled the out throughout the other funds, uh, the marina fund in particular, going from five full-time positions to two full-time positions. Um, right now, as it stands, this budget is balanced at last year's millage rate of 2.0336. Um, that is um, a very, you see that in the resolution I or the ordinance I passed out earlier, a very slight increase over the rolled back rate. It's actually less than 1% of an increase um, over the rolled back. And, you know, that's sort of the, the bottom line of the whole thing. We've got, you know, good news in several funds. The cemetery fund um, is going to generate at least what we're projecting, about a $20,000 surplus in the coming year, so that we begin to um, kind of right the ship there and get that fund balance back where it belongs. Um, the marina fund, uh, the Marine Commission's been involved in that budget review this summer, and the marina director dug down deep and has found a way, we think, to um, begin to generate sufficient revenues to cover his debt service and to have positive growth in net assets every year with a massive reduction in staff. And, uh, you know, other than that, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have or be guided by you as to what level of detail you want to talk about this at or what things you'd like to talk about. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Uh, my, and again, I've said this, so I'll, I won't say it too much. But the reality is we, we started out with an adjustment of trying to get 10% down. Correct. Ten point nine. When you have yeah, ten point nine, or pretty tough. But when you look at the it now, you know, uh, in a two two twelve two thirteen, we would have had a surplus of seven hundred fifty thousand. Going forward, now we're going to be a surplus of two twenty seven. The way I said. So the reality is, uh, the the old general. General fund budget is up over last year, not not down over last year. I mean, well, it's so what? That's seven hundred thousand, and this is I, honestly, I will never do this again, even if our Excuse financial me. advisor says to. But that seven hundred thousand came about when the eleven twelve we refinanced a loan and we made our early debt service payment, and so we dipped into the fund balance by like six hundred and eighty thousand. So in the next fiscal year, we budgeted to put that back in the fund balance by having a surplus of six hundred and eighty thousand, and that will perpetually, you know, skew our numbers back and forth between those two years um, because this year we have a full debt service payment in 1314 of 600 and some thousand you know the best way to look at this look at page I'm just looking at page 62 nine. look at page 62 of the um, operating budget book and you'll what see page you on, Cindy? Uh, 62 which 53. is 62 62 general fund non-departmental it seemed like such a good idea at the time, and it's just made a, a, a mess out of our comparables. But we had normal debt service payments in 11-12, um, actual of um, 
it should have been six or seven hundred thousand dollars. And all of a sudden, you look in eleven twelve, it was a million four because we made double debt service payments. Then you look in twelve thirteen, it's only nineteen thousand dollars because we got uh, to skip a payment for a year, and now we're back up to six eighty five. So if if we had not made an early payment, this would have been seven hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, and seven hundred thousand. And so that's that really makes the bottom line of the, all the expenditures look look sort of odd. And it's the reason that in twelve thirteen we budgeted for a seven hundred thousand dollars surplus because we dipped into it one year and we put it back in the following year. So actually, it was been, uh, it was lower than a hundred thousand if you put the six eighty back in mm-hmm. and subtracted it from the seven fifty. Mm-hmm. So not to not to confuse the issue, but that that really makes a mess out of the comparables. You should have one that says first public hearing. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, September the third on the on the cover. So page sixty-two. So I think the the best way to put it, if if you want a really good comparison of the two fiscal years' real expenditures, is you would have to take the bottom line of the general fund expenditures for twelve thirteen and add six hundred and eighty thousand dollars to subtract them. it, add it back, and you'd have about a hundred thousand bucks. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, if you were looking uh, on page ten, I'm saying that right, mm-hmm. Mr. Chairman, it'd be ten thousand. If you were looking on on page ten. And looking at the twelve thirteen expenditures of nineteen point four million, you really need to add six hundred and eighty thousand to that to, to to be a really a true full fiscal year with a full debt service payment. And so, what we're comparing is nineteen point four plus six hundred eighty thousand compared to the nineteen point four that we're showing in the current in thirteen fourteen as our proposed budget. So, so, so what you're really saying is, if you bottom line general fund would have been about twenty million dollars, mm-hmm. and against. Nineteen four this year on the same equivalent basis. On an equivalent basis. On an equivalent basis. Right. So the reality is that our our ten point nine has shrunk to about three, correct? Seven hundred thousand. Yeah, about three, three or four percent. About a three percent reduction, right? Um, I, my only point, and I'm certainly not critical of, the, of your operation. I'm, I'm very positive of what you guys are doing. Didn't take it as a criticism. But it was pretty clear as I watched the budgetary process that. Uh, a lot of, I want to say this, a lot of things the staff thought could have been done, it would have been painful, but it could have been done, or you want to put it in place. And yet in the final analysis, our elected officials elected not to let you take the pain that you thought you could take. Is that a fair way to? No, sir, <laughs> it's I, I, I think, not fair, Jim. <laughs> I disagree. I, 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 I think the clarification is is that the city council responded to the community on the services being delivered, ah. and that's this whole budget is a policy document that has to reflect what people are willing to do and what people want and. Uh, presume that they are going to be served by the community, and I think that's really what the council did. It they didn't obviously didn't work in a vacuum. If you see the number of emails that Tammy's office has received, and I never knew the value of someone who schedules tennis courts, but but we're, what we're going to do is adjust the fees to reflect to reflect what that. Demand is yeah, somebody has to pay for it. That's somebody. exactly right. Somebody that, got to pay for it. That's that's exactly right, and that's what we're trying to do. And as a budget, as a council policy statement, the the key is is we need to not only balance what people want demand for their services, but at the same time, how do we pay for those respective services? And that, that's what we're doing. And there's no question there's give and take in any budget process I've been involved in. And we were inflicting a lot of pain in order to, and we never could get to the 10.9. I mean, that, that was a number that. I didn't think uh, it could either, but, it was, but you had, you laid out the budgets yeah. with an idea of how you were going to take the pain. And there's no question. And, and the parameters we were working in are very critical, too, to understand that, that 
we were told that the number of police officers that are going to stay on the street is going to stay that 53 number. So that was a given. We mm -hmm. would not do it. We were also told the lifeguards at each stand, although we did try to buck that again this year. And uh, Cindy says the next time Last I time. have to take the beating, she's not going to do that. <laughs> we had to have the two lifeguards at each stand those seven days a week and retain the hours that we had. So parameters sort of dictate also cost. Well, yeah, I, my, my only point among, on this staff and this group is, is that uh, the city group did a pretty good job of trying to get it done. And I think they would have probably gotten halfway there. Uh, but the po politics of the city were that, that, that city council was the feet to the coal was pretty heavy. <laughs> uh, well, I see, I disagree with uh, just picking a number out of the, ha uh, the air and cutting it and not understanding. So it was, in fact, as Jim said, it's not the council. It was the will of the people who responded to the cuts. And whether it was public safety by not having the, uh, the lifeguards, uh, there was a big issue about tennis, as you mentioned. There was also an issue about the animal control. Uh, from my understanding, I mean, there was not only emails here, but uh, the uh, uh, the elected officials themselves were getting a uh, voluminous calls uh, reg from the public regarding uh, putting those back in. Now, one of the things that we're looking at is that no one wants to raise taxes, and and that's the other part, uh, Glenn, and, and for all of us is that you can't have it both ways. You can't say you want to cut. Uh, you don't want to cut the services, but uh, we're going to uh, uh, keep the taxes the same. I mean, but again, that's a policy decision. But I wanted to just throw one thing up very quickly about the police. Peter, while you're going, just to, and this is just a commentary on this whole thing, one of the issues that we face administratively when we talk about police officers, immediately we have a support group that doesn't like that. If you talk about lifeguards, you have a support group. Folks, I will tell you, if we cut everybody out of human resources, eventually the Department of Justice or the courts are going to be their resource <laughs> because we're going to make a lot of mistakes. Or if we cut finance and we're right. not recording to the auditors correctly, then you also have... And it's very difficult, and Cindy and I just sort of joke about the support group for somebody in financing. Picture the guy coming down here with the green visor saying, please don't lay off the finance person who's taking payroll every week. They, those folks just don't exist. And in many of these cuts, we took 10, I think it was, out of Public Works as an example, and we caught a little grief on the, the grass cutting. And, and hopefully we'll correct some of that. The problem that we are facing as an organization, if a hurricane does come through here, you can't get enough contractors. And in the past, when you had those two back-to-back -back hurricanes, and hopefully that will not occur while I'm here, but we had enough people to put on the streets to get the roads open, and we were able to assemble our crews until the contractors got in and helped support that. And I, I just want to make sure the community and everyone else is aware that we are taking some of those underpinnings that were sort of a the net below us out of the equation, and which means that one of these days, if we do have a hurricane, instead of cleaning up in a week, it may be four weeks. But... That's the price we must be willing to pay. And, and you know, the other thing I wanted to just point out is, you know, we, we talked about this back when we started the process at the beginning of the summer. The 10.9% was, was not arbitrary. That number was the amount of money that we are projecting we'll need to close the gap once right. we consummate the sale of the electric utility. Now, whether we get there in increments and, and we have, you know, maybe some time to do that now um, or not, but our direction at the beginning of the summer was get there in one year. And so that was the reason for that number and the reason for that percentage and, and the reason for the the attempt that we made to get there um, in clearly that's one true. I listened route. to the city call, the council meeting, and that, that was absolutely true. That's the, uh, to, to to take a hard swing at getting it to that figure. Yeah. Just, just very quickly, this is uh, the situation with the uh, uh, police department. As a result, uh, is Chief Curry behind me by any chance? No, he carries a gun. I don't want him. <laughs> 
Oh, we keep talking about those guys. So. No, <laughs> Glenn's I, already got them looking for I, us. <laughs> no, no I, as a result of uh, the captain's retirement, that's uh, approximately $119,000 in savings per year uh, with the uh, if the captain isn't uh, replaced. This is from uh, uh, the captain, uh, uh, the chief. But we will be replacing that person. With, an, uh, with a patrol uh, officer. Uh, that's where I'm going. You have a hundred and nineteen thousand. So additionally, so we added the ten back into the or we the uh, council added ten back into the uh, uh, administration, and it, so it expanded its uh, the administration from five to fifteen people. Uh, at the same time, taking away administrative reports, uh, and it also uh, uh, did away with uh, uh, addition to, to the animal control being put back in. Uh, they took away uh, uh, a crime investigator. So the chief is committed to report to the, as I understand it, Jim, back to the council in regard to uh, what he's going to do in the future because of the issue of losing the, because he has an option to, as you said, to put another, you know, some more boots on the street as an, as an alternative. Actually, his presentation is to justify, if he can, those two positions that are being cut, one CSI and one is uh, administrative. And so he'll be making that presentation Monday night at the budget as requested by the city council. Yeah. But that's, that's my only point is that the, that the originally it was like a two year horizon before uh, the captain was going to retire or that was evaluated. That's correct. We had a three year plan and that's why when we signed the three year contract with the uh, police unions and the lieutenant. So there's two unions there is to project that over a three year period uh, to try to meet that goal. No, I just wanted to make that point that I knew that the, the chief said he, he's going to be working on it, but that was some of the some of the framework that. Uh, but, but there again, but there again, uh, the chief had a plan in place that he could he thought he could implement without these two men. Correct. He budgeted that way and said he could make it work. That, well, that is correct. He budgeted that way under the Stress. auspices of what I gave as the parameters right. in which to work. The the problem is, for example, the CSI. What that does is backlog cases. We just had that murder at the uh, at the hotel. Right. I mean, it wouldn't keep us from solving it. The problem is, is that we can't address it as quickly. But yes, I mean, we, if we were giving those parameters and the and given direction that we're going to cut 10 percent, then that's we would we as an organization, and I think Cindy and I have said that all along, you tell us what the rules are and we, we will put the organization in that structure. Are we going to deliver the same services on the same time frame as we do today? And the answer is probably no, we would not. But again, it comes back to what the public is willing to pay for, as That's reflected in our elected officials. And yes, sir. If, in fact, the electoral officials don't want to take the heat. <laughs> Uh, it, then uh, the implication doesn't get done. I mean, it, it's pretty clear that I, I watch you guys operate. You're operating on much more stress than you were before, and you took the heat and you took your loss of staff, and uh, yet those departments that have a lot more political influence have been sheltered a little bit by political leadership. That's what it comes down to. I like to think of it more as support groups and those that are out in the front. It's like, you know, one of our provisions that we were talking about closing is, is our cashier windows and right. the drive through right. Now, there's right. nobody that's going to come walking in here and say, please keep the cashier windows open until they close, and then we will hear about the cashier windows. And that's <laughs> yeah. uh, it's sort of like the grass cutting. Nobody had any problem with it until we found out it was during the rainy season and the grass was growing. Well, it also grew in uh, uh, the areas that uh, the city took care of, didn't it? That is true. That is true. But, but, but in our particular case, and, and again, 
just to make sure down in the bowels we only pay for what they perform. Right. But the, the key is, is you're right, Peter, but we, when you take a contractor, we're not going to be his only client. His client, and he's going to schedule so many days in the city of Vero Beach, and then he, he, it's just like if you get your yard cut by someone, if you have a bad season time, then you might not get it cut on a Thursday if you're looking forward to it. It may be that Friday or the following Monday, and that's how it worked with us. Well, it, that's, that I think is all of our points. Is that if you want, to, if if the public wants the service, they're going to have to pay for it. Otherwise, they're going to have to accept whatever, whether they be delays or not having uh, uh, lifeguards there all the time, or the fountains not running. I mean, that's the reality. Yeah, the the key is, as you stop and think, uh, the complaint on the grass was, is that there were clogs of the brown grass. And I, I agree, that was there. And in the city's case, our guys would usually run over it three or four times and you wouldn't have the brown grass. Because we had the high-growing season, too, with, with the rains. And there, in our particular case with the contract, you pay for mowing one time. Now, the question is, is the brown globs of grass on the top of the surface during the wet season worth $50,000 to our community? It's pretty, it's everything, unfortunately, boils down to a mathematical equation and, and dollars. But it still, come, it still comes back to, on the fact that the city is a microcosm of the whole world we're living in at the federal level. And none of us are willing to take decreases. And, that, and at some point, uh, uh, something has to give. <laughs> Either we raise the taxes and have the courage to tell the public we're going to raise the taxes. Now, I've said to Cindy, and Cindy and I have had some discussions, and I, I, for one, will tell you, I think the public is, does not understand the finances of the city uh, any more than it understands the federal level budget. Uh, and that's partially our fault. And I've, I've said to Cindy, I think we as a group need to find a simple way to communicate the budget problems to the city. And I... And that, that means we have to use our website better. And somehow we need to get a simpler financial statement out in front of people so they can see the impact. Uh, I, for one, have tried to take the budget and compare it to the 10-year budget, as I would as, as a banker. I would take the, the old financial statement and project forward three or four years using ratios to try to get where we're going. And... The public can't see that. It doesn't see it, you know. Uh, you know, let's stop and think real quick. When we say the public can't see that, we get 25 emails. That's a big onslaught. We have 15,000 people. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is the public, there, there was a very good article that I read about the state of California. And the state of California has all kinds of financial issues. But it, when it really turned sour in the state of California is when they tried to convince everybody how budgets work. And then you had the support groups that came out and said, I now understand I need more money for the park. And they conceded. I now understand we need more policemen. And they conceded because you had a lot of people trying to make decisions through these, you know, they had the police oversight commissions and they had all these other people that were given and they had their little niche that they were overseeing but that was the effort by the state of california and through uh, the taxpayers revolt or whoever it was we want more transparency we want to be more involved well they started running up because nobody kept an eye on the revenues because there was never a a group that sat around and talked about revenues because nobody wanted to talk about taxes everybody <laughs> wanted to talk about all the things sure. we want right. and now they're in a real issue and now people are starting to look at revenue say i don't want any more revenues but at the same time i still want my garbage picked up three times a week or whatever they do in california and and they the, the key is glenn i guess when you get down to it i am not sure you're going to convince or show fifteen thousand people how to read this document as many times Can. as we no. write it and rewrite it and, and do it it's it's a challenge but you know what 
I, I will say, and we, we talked about this a little bit, and I looked into it some more after we talked about it. One of the things that the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, encourages is a thing called popular annual financial reporting, where they have a prescribed format for taking the CAFR, all of this, which 90% of the people are not going to read, and turning it into a very small, high-level, informative yeah. brochure about where the city's finances stand, liabilities, major issues, fund balances, etc. Um, I I have long wanted to uh, to do one of those, and have just been you know kind of crazy busy since I got here. But I think it's something I'd like to take a look at for the for the CAFR for um, twelve thirteen is to find a way to to put one of those together, work with you, the finance commission, have a look at it, see what you think, and put that out there as a as a synopsis, if you will, or a high level overview of of all the information that's contained in here. That it is a little more user friendly. Um, the other thing I'd like to do, and, and maybe we could just talk about this right now, is take you up on your offer to do quarterly financial reports rather than monthly, and maybe try to revamp those a little bit so that they're they're a little more user-friendly as well and, and a little more useful than just page after page of numbers. So, um, so I, you know, I, but I agree with you as well, though. You're only going to have a certain number of people that are interested enough to, to take the time. And, um, and We're also going to put it are online, aren't, are you not? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So it'll be online and then get quarterly reports. Uh, and of course, uh, the general ledger is here. If someone was is keenly interested, so I, I don't have any problem with that recommendation. Go with quarterlies and try to revamp them a little bit and try try a new format. That's, That's fine with me. I think this. Yeah, I think the staff's doing a great job. We don't need to be doing ah. monthly. We can cut the costs. And right. Do it yeah. quarterly. Yeah, I agree with that. Mr. I can just make a point. Dan, I think you need to hit your microphone. You can tell. Okay. Uh, I don't think the commission should overreact to what I saw about six members of the community at the last public workshop come up to the, the, the dice and make some statements. Uh, what I heard was uh, comments in regard to the cemetery and the uh, animal control position, you know, and those were, and they, and they were well spoken uh, points. And, you know, whether you're for that, uh, the city owning the cemetery or for the position of the animal control, those two positions are not that big a dent in the budget. <laughs> the white elephant that I see in our budget and I've, for the last couple of years has been, at least in my opinion, the way I, the, the words and numbers that I'm reading is the uh, defined benefit pension obligation of this city. And it's funny that of all the public hearings that we've had, I don't think anyone has come up to address that, with, with the exception of one member of the uh, Taxpayers Association. She, she made a very fine argument. And uh, we need to address that. And I think when we do that, we are necessarily into the area of union negotiations, at least with the police department and I think one other union. Could you say how those negotiations are going? I think they're going as well as can be expected, although um, they're going to drag out a little longer than we hoped. We have engaged an attorney, uh, I think Glenn, you and Cindy have talked about. We reconstituted the General Employees Pension Board. It's been a standing board for many years. Nobody knew about it until Cindy called me one day and said, you won't believe this, but you and I are on this pension board and we've got uh, liability exposure for not making decisions. And it was something that stayed dormant. So we've taken that. It's in the code. And so we have that responsibility and we're, we're taking it very seriously, but we've engaged a, 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 an attorney who is familiar with pension plans and the transition of pension plans and giving us advice on the legal issues surrounding what we have as our general employees defined uh, benefit program. At the same time, we've re-engaged our investing, uh, the group that we use, Prudential, uh, as our investing, and we're going to start having them come to our meetings. And then we also have engaged Rocky again to make sure that Rocky is up to date as to the changes in the transition that we're going to do. The council has been very clear. We're going to go from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. And so we are getting ourselves familiar with the legalities of that transition. And we are understanding that we are freezing a plan, we are not eliminating a plan. And, and those two terms are very important in the 
uh, discussions as we go forward, but we're freezing the plan and there are certain caveats that go along with that. And I think we're getting ourselves educated to understand what that really means. As we transition into the defined contribution plan, what we're going to, what we're trying to figure out is how we negotiate in good faith with the unions to do that. We've given ourselves a little flexibility in this budget, uh, that $227,000, because to go to a defined contribution plan, there's going to have to be a match on behalf of the city with the employees that will, at the end of the day, have them with some type of pension plan. Otherwise, we will never recruit anybody to this organization unless they're really unemployable. So we've got to make sure that we have folks that we can attract and, and the, 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 the fringe benefits are, is an important factor of that. So we are realigning that and we understand the defined contribution and, and the, will of the, the will of the council to do that. But we've got to structure it and so we're, we are negotiating with the union. We understand there's two components to that. One is the employee contribution, two is the city uh, contribution. In those discussions, we made it very clear and we understand administratively what we're doing is that we are eliminating future risk and taking on annual risk. And that's just the risk. And that's going to be borne by the employee as much as it is to the city, but it'll be just what our contributions are and those matching contributions. So that's where we are. We, we think the unions understand where we're going to wind up. At the same time, there is a lot of room for negotiations in that, and obviously there's a lot of resistance. But, okay. but well, you well, make the, a good uh, point that the idea is that if we can, if we can freeze that plan, uh -huh. um, then going forward, there is no growth in that liability except what might be created by, you know, another bad year of investments. If we can, combined with that, take some major proceeds from the sale of the electric utility and fund that plan up to the place where it needs to be, then our annual contributions go down and our, our, our risk, our, our liability will not grow from this point forward if we manage it properly. So that's really the, the initiative here is to turn it into something that's simply an simply a annual budgeted amount and all the risk is shifted back the other direction. So. And about seven years of inflation would get us balanced assuming that the liabilities don't go up. Uh, Ed, I mentioned that uh, I've attended a number of the uh, police pension boards, and they are public meetings, so it's going to be announced when uh, uh, General Fund uh, has their meeting, and obviously anyone, and we're all welcome to attend. Uh, uh, and and we can, and when we get to item D, I was going to talk some more about how people can be part of those meetings too. I love this item. We should put this in front. This is the this is the most interesting one. <laughs> and we do take minutes at those meetings. The city clerk's office takes those minutes and has those available because those are sunshine meetings. Um, I, I, I would propose that as uh, um, a public. Uh, a public comment uh, from the Finance Commission. I would like to draft something on behalf of the Commission talking about some of the points uh, philosophically that were brought up, such as uh, uh, you know, the services, and you, you, you have to either pay for the services or accept the services that you want. Uh, and I would, rather than getting into an uh, elaborate uh, uh, analysis of the plan because the council uh, wants us uh, wants a reply for the uh, uh, proposed budget. And you are an advisory, yes, yes, sir. No, and uh, I don't have a problem with that, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Okay. Well, what I would what I would like to do is uh, uh, and keep me honest, please, uh, Tammy. Exactly. Is to is. I don't know how to do this, to, uh, to draft something and send it out without breaking any of the uh, rules. Send it through Tammy. Send it to Tammy, she can send it out. Yeah, if you send it to me, I'll send it out individually to each one of you, so you can't respond back. Okay, if, if that's suitable. So so that we can lay out some of these issues, and, and I, I, want, I think the point about educating the public is, is, is critical. Uh, for an understanding that uh, uh, you're right, no one. This is indecipherable 
uh, to try to cross rough all of the different annotations. I mean, even for us who are familiar are having, and particularly when you end up with, uh, you know, half of the Amazon uh, cut down. Or just but, go next door to your next door neighbor and sit down and say, let's talk about this. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it better be a cocktail hour, excuse me. <laughs> um, so, so my point is that uh, unless there's, there's a compelling need to go through any, uh, anything that uh, the, the commission picked up is to take that approach, uh, I would all, if that's uh, satisfactory. And then, then secondly, we have a monthly report and quarterly analysis we are required. Uh, if you wanted to, and then there's the budget amendment, and then the uh, 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 the pension. But it, it would just seem to me to spend any amount of time on the June budget to me doesn't make any sense. Uh, in and terms actually, of it, what I was going to suggest, Mr. Chairman, is that that variance analysis really should be considered in conjunction with the budget amendment because one led to the other. So, you know, really, if you'd like to just skip over that and look at the budget amendment, that's anything that was of any note that was contained in the June quarterly analysis became incorporated into the budget amendment right, because it right. needed to be so. And, and uh, uh, last thing, if I could, before we leave the thirteen fourteen budget, can we talk about the the trees in the forest? Um, you know, whenever we prepare a budget package for any workshop or any public hearing, um, that complete package is available online as a PDF. Um, so if it's okay with you as a commission, um, if you want a hard copy, because you do want to go sit with your neighbor and go through the budget line by line, um, I'll be happy to make you one. But if we could go to uh, on request basis, so if you if you want a hard copy of the pile, great, I'll make you one. And if you don't, I'll, I'll just make sure that the electronic version is available to you. And then that way, when the budget is finalized and adopted, and it's the adopted budget for the next fiscal year, I'll give you a hard copy, and that'll be the useful one throughout the year. Can we go with that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. That's and really, okay. I don't mind making you a copy if you want one, but I don't want you to have to dedicate a wing of your house to like the, all the variations of the, the budget. Yeah, well, not only that, but for the first four, three or four months, it really is because of the timing of periodic uh, debt payments and whatever, uh, lags in uh, uh, employee payments over two weeks, really isn't uh, uh, until you get into past the first quarter. I'm actually talking about the budget the budget books themselves. I'm still back on the budget books, all, all these versions of the budget books. Well, I thought we were talking about the monthly. No, before we left this topic, I wanted to see if I could stop making so many <coughs> copies of these for everyone. So if, if yeah, that works fine. for you, is sure. that okay? Okay. Sure. Most of us do it by our computers anyway. You can look right. at it as a PDF. You can print the pages yeah. that matter to you. And if you, and like right. I said, once, once it's adopted, I'll make sure you all have a copy of the adopted version. Great. Plus, you should do what the telephone companies shift the paper cost onto the you know public. <laughs> it's you know it's not just a paper; it's it's staff time and, and right. oh, it takes yeah. time. Yeah, well, we talked. About. Remember when deregulation was going to right. drive your phone bill down? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out great. Didn't it? Um, well, uh, the only thing I'm going to say, uh, I, I will uh, on the variance analysis. On a go going forward basis, the, what, the, what shocked me a little bit, and I told you this, we didn't do a variance analysis of the Recreation Department, and yet in the final analysis, the amendment, the variance amendment, that's going into effect in September, showed a $100,000 uptick in the Recreation Department. While all other departments did a pretty good job of getting close to or below their projected budgets. I know all the departments did a great job, except for the rec. We did talk about that a little bit. Yes. You know, the, the issue with the, uh, the recreation department is that that um, particular line item, it was primarily part-time uh, salaries, didn't show a variance because it ticks along at a very small level until summer comes, and then it cranks up to four times the amount. So, you know, Jim and I have talked about it. We're going to sit with Rob and find a way um, before next summer comes that he can get information on a payroll by payroll basis as he moves into the summer months so that he could do a better job of, of monitoring that and planning for that accordingly. Well, that but that one kind of exploded. It was seasonal and yeah. it really does. The payroll triples budget. in the right. summer. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't present a variance until it was kind of already gone by. So. I understand. 
but we will definitely be on that one for next year. Um, so let's talk briefly sort of overall about the budget amendment, and then um, we can address maybe a couple of specifics. Again, as many or as few as you want. Um, we had three or four things that are always a major impact at the end of the year to the budget that are reflected in the budget amendment. The first one is we get to this point in the year where we can actually project out what our final salaries and wages are going to be because we only have a few payrolls left and what the accrual is going to be and we have a really good number for salaries and wages and as a result Social Security. Um, for most of the departments, I think if you look through there, there was a there were positive variances on salaries, um, and a lot of that is because as we've had turnover and we've had a fair amount, we've had vacant positions, and in some cases held those positions open on purpose, looking to the coming year's budget adjustments or trying to make sure that the department can absorb the payouts for sick and vacation accruals within their department by holding the position open long enough that they can come in at or under their salary budget for the year. And you'll see if you look through this um, that that's been very successful. The second place where we had a major adjustment that affected all funds is the pension contributions. As we've talked about, we budget each year for a pension contribution that's based on the best actuarial valuation that we have at the time, which is the one that comes out in March. Then when we get to <coughs> March again, we get a valuation that's effective for the year that we're in that may go up and may go down. And in this particular case, the one for 12-13 that we got in March 13 went up about $487,000 citywide. Um, and so those pension contributions are reflected in the revised budget. We anticipate that when we get this valuation in March 14 for 13-14 uh, for the year that we've just completed, that that number is going to go back in the other direction because, as we talked about, we got rid of the we've amortized out the 2008 losses. But anyway, that's a fairly big impact on the budget. The third thing that affects all funds is we're at that point in the year where we only have one more month of health insurance costs to pay, and we can say with a fair amount of accuracy what those are going to be per fund. We had, um, in almost every case, a decrease um, in the budgeted amounts because of two things. One, vacant positions, as we just discussed. And two, when we budgeted last year, the way we structured our health insurance renewal actually caused people to, during open enrollment, go down to lower cost plans. And so those two things combined resulted in pretty much across the board cheaper health insurance costs than we originally budgeted for. And then finally, throughout this, there's adjustments in other revenue and expense line items that are based on our quarterly variance analysis, things that for the most part we knew were coming. Um, examples. Interest on investments have not been as good this year as we budgeted. Uh, we had um, a dune restoration project that we didn't anticipate because of the storm that took out our dunes back in November. But on the same hand, we had um, improvements in things that we didn't expect, as we talked about salaries and, and health insurance costs improved. We had a few other revenue sources like ad valorem that were higher than the budget. And so bottom line, um, all the funds that we have in this amendment are still to the good, um, with the exception of a very slight uh, turnover in the marina that we hope won't um, materialize quite a, to the 11000 or so that we see in the budget amendment. And the general fund at the bottom line is actually about $35,000 lower, even after it absorbs that, that hit from you know the recreation transfer than the original budgeted amount. And I think the, the bottom line of this is that we feel like the budgetary controls we've put in place, the quarterly reviews that we do with you and the commission are working. Um, they worked pretty well last year, and they're working extremely well this year. We have department heads fully engaged in um, making sure that they understand that their adopted budget is their bottom line. And when they run into situations or, or expenditures they don't expect, they look to another place in their budget, and they find a way to absorb those things that are under their control. Um, and so... What we'd like to do is um, take this to council for first reading, probably September the 17th, and do second reading um, in October so that we only have to do this one time this year. Um, we have to adopt a budget amendment if we're going to before uh, the end of November. And we didn't really have much of a need for a mid-year one, and pretty much everything in here is good news. So we're <coughs> looking for the 17th and then the second reading sometime in October. And so with that, we're happy to, I'm happy to answer any specific questions you have. We do have one replacement page. Somehow our spreadsheet lost its mind on solid waste, and so you see a bunch of numbers there that don't jive, so i got a replacement page for that. <clears throat> the only comment I have is uh, interest revenues. 
Those have been revised downwards. Pardon? Those estimates have been revised downwards in here. We, yep. Yep. you know, I'll tell you this. We in, And this is another piece of what we were talking about earlier with Mr. Gifanti. That, that's why we brought it up, yeah. We are restricted by law in, in terms of how we can invest our short-term idle cash money. Um, and we're restricted in terms of the kinds of investment vehicles we're allowed to use and the horizons on those investment vehicles. And so when you sit with a lot of your money in, you know, nothing with a maturity greater than seven years, average 3.6 year uh, T-bills, if that's the place where you've been for the last six or seven months, you're probably not really happy with your investment return either. Um, we have taken the approach, too, of recognizing um, unrealized gains and losses monthly when we reconcile our accounts rather than pushing them off to a year end adjustment and that shows um, so in terms of the investment allocation for our um, these funds it is something that I would like to work with the Finance Commission to look at I've, I've um, spoken with my investment advisor Cutwater they worked with other cities to craft investment policies that are still legal within Florida statute guidelines but that might help us to get a slightly more robust mix and still preserve uh, the primary goal which is liquidity because these are the funds that comprise our, our fund balances, our working capital and utilities. And so liquidity and safety are the two number one priorities um, before you get to investment returns. But certainly we could do better than this. And so that's something we'll be looking at over the coming year. Any comments? Any other comments? Uh, Cindy, I, I, I noticed in, in the attachments, uh, the amendments, I noticed that uh, when you looked at the marina, uh, you know, their, their diesel costs against the revenue base, uh, initially costs were projected at about 77% of revenue. And, um, and and we've had a fair amount of overcrowd. And when we adjusted the budget back, we're still only uh, 77, 80%. So th th there seems to be a little skew between the gas and the diesel. <laughs> That his margin is a little better. I don't know what I, he's doing, but you know. Yeah, I forget which way it is. His margin's a, a little better on one than the other. He's getting, running about twenty percent on one, twenty-five or so on the other. You know, we we want to have another look at this. Um, I think what happened is we didn't budget the appropriate margin in the original budget that's what because it like to me. costs yeah. went up a bunch more than revenues went up by. Yeah, um, his margins so, yeah. were holding. That's what yeah. it looked to me like. Yeah, yeah. and so this. I don't know what happened in the twelve thirteen original budget, but apparently the, that yeah, mix was not not a good one. But going and, forward, he looks he, he looks like he's going to have to watch mm -hmm. his margins a little mm -hmm. tighter. And his margins, the act, his actual margins, he does keep a really good eye on. He's been adjusting fuel costs. He's been hitting the numbers. He's been you know making increases as appropriate. But somehow that didn't get reflected in the numbers that were placed in the yeah. budget. Well, and I and so yeah. So what we're showing is he's actually going to dip into his cash if all of this holds and some of this you know when we do. A budget amendment we have two two things in mind um, you know we have certain portions of our budget that show up in the CAFR where budget versus actuals have to be compared because you know of the appropriations but in an enterprise fund you have no budget versus actual comparisons it's just a financial statement like you're running a business so we amend these budgets for the enterprise funds because we'd like to know how we're going to do at year end versus sure. what we thought but where this really comes out I try to be conservative and it may be better than that so hopefully he's going to break even this year and then next year, with the huge cuts in staff that he's made, um, he should he should be in good shape. Yeah. Okay. But you're right. We need to have another look at that one. Yeah. In terms of how we budgeted it. Yeah. <clears throat> Cindy. And anything else that you you'd like to talk about in particular, or with this budget amendment, or um, if I could. Uh, if you want to make some sort of a formal motion or statement for council so that when I actually put this in front of them for a first reading, I can say the Finance Commission liked it or endorsed it or whatever your, your motion might be. I'll make a uh, proposal for acceptance of the amendment. I'll second that. I'm an alternate. Can I do that? I'm an alternate member of the commission. Can I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even with uh, Scott left? Oh, Scott did live. Okay, you can fill his position. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to be legal. <laughs> so, 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 all, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Unanimous. 
I will present that uh, as well to the uh, sure. uh, to the city council. Uh, uh, just mentioning that uh, uh, the two points uh, that there's going to be one uh, amendment in October, and uh, that the budget is on track. Without getting into any. Right. Sure. So we're on the long-awaited item D. I don't know that I actually have anything left to say. I think we've talked about it. All. <laughs> no, um, seriously. Uh, I think you all got a copy of some of the, the questions that um, that Mr. Bravant had sent out, and he and I had a chance to, to talk for a little while this morning. So just kind of to recap what we've been talking about. The... Pension plan itself, the assumptions, the mix of retirees versus active participants, all of that is contained in our annual actuarial valuation. So I will make sure that, and I have a, um, a PDF version of this, I'll have to send you the hard copy, although this is even more entertaining than a budget if you'd like to discuss it with your neighbors. Um, this, uh, this actuarial evaluation I'll provide to you so that you have some of that information. And that was a, a few of the questions that were on your list. Um, this... Uh, pension fund is audited annually, and those statements are included in the CAFR. And if you look in um, your CAFR, for instance, for fiscal 12, uh, starting on page 75, there are some notes that recap really the high points of the actuarial valuation. And starting on page 81 are some actual financial statements that show investment earnings, uh, the investment expenses associated with the pension fund, and the flow of funds, contributions by us, payments to retirees, etc. Um, we have had, for many, many years, uh, Prudential as our investment advisor. And as Jim pointed out, um, what we recently discovered is that by resolution, we actually have a general employee pension board um, that was established as part of the pension plan. Um, and I think for many years, it was sort of a committee of one. And when we started talking and, and looking more at our investments and, and our performance in the fund, and particularly when we started uh, talking about freezing this plan, um, I kind of brought it to everyone's attention that we were a board and said, hey, you know, it's time to meet as a board. I don't know if you've ever watched the pension board meetings that the police department has. They do an excellent job. They meet on a quarterly basis. Their investment advisors come. Their attorneys come. They review their mix of investments. They review their performance. They uh, address legislative changes that may affect their pension plan, and they take it very seriously. So we feel like we need to do the same, particularly with the changes that are, are kind of in the wind for the plan. So we did um, start having uh, formal meetings, and we're currently trying to set up quarterly meetings. But one of the first things we did was hire, put out an RFP and hire an attorney. So now we have a very good qualified uh, pension board attorney who is also um, got some expertise when it comes to freezing and transitioning plans. And the second thing that we did is we had Prudential, our investment advisor, come and have some conversation with us uh, about our investment mix and about our performance. One of the things they put together for us for that meeting was a, and they do this annually anyway, but this time they shared it with the whole committee rather than just me, um, is an allocation, asset allocation review that has a very good detailed uh, set of information about the funds, the funds management benchmarks. So I'll make some copies of these and provide that to you as well. Um, so we are going to have very formal uh, quarterly meetings review this, and um, we have begun drafting uh, potential revisions to the plan for the specifics of the freeze. And then more importantly, if we do make that freeze, um, we're going to have to relook our investment mix because as you pointed out it's going to have to have a different goal in mind if that is no longer a robust plan but simply a plan that's earning um, and paying out benefits with no new money going in so those are sunshine meetings I don't know I don't think we've established the date for our next one but once we do we'll you know make sure you all know it and yeah did I you find one yet we are looking um, for our next one in November okay yeah and it is going to be here in the council chamber November. so I'll let y'all know mm -hmm. And um, at that time, plan to do um, essentially exactly what the police pension board does, um, have our investment advisor here and um, have our attorney here and, and continue to work through the issues with the plan. Does, does the report uh, uh, 
direct the answers to the the, the illiquid investment of roughly I, I five, it, five million dollars, et cetera. I, I believe it will, you will find your answers okay. in here, but I, I'll show you this um, uh, after the meeting, and then make sure everyone gets copies of it, and then anything that you don't feel like you, you're getting the information you need from this, we'll pass those questions directly to to. Dean. Just a very long investment. That's all. Uh, I, I'd right. like to see what it is. You right. know, Prudential actually took over from. Oh my God, I, I wish I could remember it was it was not Cigna, but it was one of those ones that were kind of big right. in the business for a while, and then I guess were bought or merged with Prudential, and that's when Prudential became the city's investment advisor. So it has been, you know, kind of quite some time, I think, since we went out to RFP, but, you know, by the same token with all the other changes in the wind, I think we 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 think we might be better served by working with Prudential to, um, to identify whether our mix of investments is appropriate and whether we're handling things properly and how we're going to move forward with this DB freeze rather than to go through the exercise of changing investment advisors as well when I look at their performance against what I'm seeing um, you know in the rest of the industry I, I think they're they're doing a you know, pretty good job with our money as the, best as the, they can. The investment policy is going to be the critical part and again the police department changes periodically there's we probably had the same investment policy for 25 years or something so I, I think the advisors as long as they're qualified are all pretty much the same the key is is to make sure your policy guides them in that investment where the returns are and it changes the market changes yeah, well, one of the things that uh, uh, the police did uh, that impacted the uh, pension was they had a uh, uh, an eight and a half percent uh, rate of return which was unrealistic so what they have done is they're lowering their rate sure. in, in steps, which in turn makes the uh, deficit larger because yeah. you're not getting the return. But it's more realistic. Right. And uh, that obviously is one of the uh, uh, tracking that you're going to to, to and, and that's what uh, Rocky had presented to us when he was here to begin to lower the uh, uh, expected investment rate. So, but and, and again, by the same token, I worked with uh, because I actually do the financial statements for the police pension board and for the the little fire pension we have. I worked with their actuary, even though they lowered their investment rate of return in their actuarial valuation by a little tick. What we also did was make the assumption we would make the entire city contribution on the 1st of October. And by doing it early, rather than waiting till the end of the year, sure. that changes the assumptions as well. And we were able to mitigate the effect of the one with the effect of the other. Yeah. Again, coming back to the General Employee Pension Board, that's been done a variety of different ways over the last few years. Um, you know, there were years my predecessor funded the whole thing in October, or funded enough of it in October that it was mostly done. And then in March, when he got the valuation, you know, you don't want to put too much in, so you have to wait for the valuation and make sure you don't overshoot the mark. But but there is an assumption inherent in the valuation for what time of the year the money gets funded. I've gone back to a situation given all the um, all the the state of flux that everything's been in is I've been funding it monthly because what I didn't want to do is put the whole year's contribution in only to find that midway through the year we we changed what we were doing. And so this is, again, something the pension board needs to discuss. Even though we, we in one year we may take our little um, investment rate of return assumption and tick, make it downward a little bit, we can do things to mitigate the impact and we can begin to, to bring that into the right place. So. Cindy, I think what you are doing is wise in that it's the longer the money's in there, the longer it has right. to make money. So mm -hmm. put it in near the beginning of the year. But to put a great lump sum in is kind of a crapshoot, you know. So because it may not make that money. Dollar yeah. cost yeah. averaging so that if you put some in monthly, like maybe front load it towards yeah. the beginning of the year, you Average, spread yeah. out some of the risk of getting a get, getting a bad market day and missing. You know. I felt a little better about that too because yeah, theoretically, if you put it in the beginning, of the year, but the actuaries will treat it like it's going to happen. But yes, that's a theory. If you put it all in in October and the first quarter is terrible, then you're, you're not going to come back to the place where, where you should have been. And so I I agree that that monthly thing on my part has been about that as well, about, you know, and there's well, theory and then there's reality. So I did call the county just so everybody didn't see what the county was doing. The county's for the state. And then I went on to the state website and <clears throat> compared to the overall performance and and I, I, when I after got done, I mean the performance at the, at the local level with Prudential seemed to be about in line with uh, where the state was. With the Florida retirement system, is that your, the Florida retirement system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about in line, you know. Yeah. Uh, the timing was a little different on when the returns were made. I think. 
But, and it's uh, also about the same as with our police. So they're all ranking and they're running the same in the same return. Yeah. Uh, but again, because the police board, for instance, has been sort of actively managing their investments. One of the things I've seen them do in the last year that they shied away from for ages is they've gotten back cautiously into real estate and it's been working out for them. You know, they've mm-hmm. been having some great returns on those those managed real estate funds and that's something that we don't have in our mix. So again, as this board uh, becomes more engaged, there I think there's lots we can do to, uh, to more actively manage these funds. Well, you're going to have to. Mm-hmm. You'll have to. There's no question about it. Yeah. Actually, they, they call some of those investments alternatives, like being in commodities and real estate, and I think most managers have included a percentage in portfolios in those types of assets, which, you know, would be a change in the investment policy, but very much in line with what's being done in management. I, I know I like these reports that you have given us quarterly, um, you know, from Prudential and you have put results um, for one year, three years in the letter. I'm not necessarily seeing them in the report. But it should be on that first page in the yeah, top just, left corner. Yeah. But that they looked in line with what is happening. I, I feel that as well. And this is sort of the very expanded version of that. So um, this this is like, the, I guess the front piece of this is sort of what you've been seeing. And this is a very expanded version of that that goes, you know, fund by fund, asset manager by asset manager. So I think this will be useful for you guys as well. And this actually addresses one of the questions the gentleman had. It showed the growth of the portfolio in this graph. You know, it started in 2008, so it shows you how much of the value of the portfolio is due to earnings and how much is due to the um, contributions. And so you did see that uh, it has pretty well recovered from its dip. But I thought that was a helpful graph. Up at the top, and this was the, the part I was talking about too, up at the top, it has that performance comparisons of this plan versus the S&P 500 and, and some of the other indexes as well. So so, so with that, um, we'll uh, get some of this information out that's, that's you know supplemental that will help you understand um, where we stand a little better and then make sure that you get the information about our next pension board meeting. I do have a, a question on the... Variance and how you put this together. I'm going to go through the is, report. The in, interest on investments is always extremely optimistic in the budget process, and the actual today is so much below. And I think, is this just kind of a plug number? If yeah. you, you need to come up with some revenue? You no, know, it's just been really terrible the last couple of years. I mean, if you look back at the actuals from um, 10, 11, um, 9, 10, 11, 12, it, it was $100,000, 120, dollars $130,000. Last couple of years have been kind of terrible. And I've been rolling with um, 1% of, of available invested funds, which is a pretty low amount. Um, but... Uh, one of the things I'm going to try to do over the coming years see if there isn't some way we can get, we can get back in that one percent range with some uh, work with you guys and and then um, some work with so, my investment so wasn't advisor. Just trying to balance the budget by putting. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, if you look over the last if you look over the last two years of budgets, I've consistently taken the budgeted number down, down, down on all funds because we're just not getting there anymore. But if you look at the actuals from a couple of years back, they they really were 150, 180 thousand dollars, and now we're down to, I don't know, it might be 20 this year. Catherine, just for information, we usually are approaching the budget in the other direction, that is trying to be as conservative as possible. So, it, well, What I, I know I always have as an offset is I always buy trim law, and you know this, I, I budget 95% ad valorem proceeds, and I always, you know, historically collect 96 or 97 yeah. percent. So certainly there's like, you know, two, that, that helps a little bit if our investment earnings aren't, aren't really that good. If, if I've only budgeted forty or $50,000, I, I usually know at least that that'll take up the slack. So. Yeah, I noticed that when I looked at the, uh, uh, what you sent to the county in terms of what the expected total was, which is about a hundred thousand dollars more than what you budgeted, understanding that it's about ninety-seven percent collectible as opposed to a hundred. But there is, as you said, a buffer in there of some amount. It appears, uh, 
But the trim law has the 95 percent. Right. The the DR 420 you have the the actual tax levy is 100 percent of the levy. That's what um, I'm saying. Under yeah. trim law, you you can budget 95 yeah, percent. That's what I was saying. And if you look in our CAFR historicals, our historical collection rate has been somewhere between 96 and 97. No, Mr. Chairman, I raised the issue with the, the finance department about doing a, a two or three year budget and was specifically told that state law won't allow us to do it. Some states, you know, like Texas has meets only 45 days a year and they do a two year budget. Now, there are some merits to that. It sends them home in 45 days and lets the professional staff run the place properly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but they have the oil revenues they don't have to worry about. <laughs> you know, after, after you told me that, I started looking for a job in Texas. No. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is three years is two elections for us. Right, right. Yeah. Now, that's the other thing. Yeah. 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 And it would help. On, uh, a lot, in, in, in fairness, um, we, obviously we can't do a two-year budget. But we certainly can do a forward, you know, pro forma budget, a, a pro forma operating statement, so the public begins to understand the impact of year one changes, how they affect year two and year three. Do they really make a difference? Uh, and that would be an ideal world if we could get sort of that done. Uh, uh, and I think it would help the public. But, but again, Jim's probably right. The public's only about 20% of the public votes anyway. So maybe it doesn't help. I don't know. But I, I think what we've done, especially here in Vero, is we've taken the budget as really a year round. The mere fact that yep. you guys are so engaged is an indication that it's a year round effort for us now because yeah, we is. know that next year's not going to be any better than the previous year. But at the same time, we've got to gear the organization to be able to, to meet that, that obstacle. Um, yeah, I, I think the other thing is that, uh, at least in. in going through Publix every now and again, uh, people would stop me because of the, uh, the TV that's, uh, that's shown. And then when you get to social events, uh, a lot of people are, are in fact, and of course the local media is all over the place on these things, but still, so there is some attention to it, that, uh, particularly for those who are interested. But as you say, Glenn, the percent that vote and... Uh, you know, right. just want to come out and complain about the lifeguards. Yeah. <laughs> but an abundance of optimism, I am going to try to make it a goal for this year to, to see if I can't produce one of those popular annual, you've seen them, I'm sure, annual financial reports, no, at least a rudimentary one. <laughs> and I, actually, I haven't, and I wondered if you had given thought to what would be in that report. Well, How you the GFOA has some guidelines, and then um, I found some good examples. You know, um, their guidelines are you know relatively broad, like they are with popular budget reporting and that kind of thing. Um, but I've found w what I think are some really excellent examples of well done ones. So um, maybe I'll send an email out through Sherry and, and share um, the GFOA guidance and um, some links to what I think are some good ones with with you on the commission, so you can have a look at them and see if you think that's something that's worth pursuing. It sounds like more work for you, or can it come? Yeah. Out it, I mean, it would be, it would be, but you know, it, it might be useful. Yeah, mm -hmm. it certainly would be useful. <laughs> you know, the other it, side of that uh, coin is she's got to answer those questions anyway, so she might as well have them written. Yeah, I, I, we may be able to save off some of those questions, and it may be that that, in conjunction with our CAFR report, in place of it for most people, would be a better look at the city's finances. So it could be, it is definitely more work, but it could end up, you know, yeah. making better communication and saving some time. And I'll trade it for monthly financial statements. How's that? Well. <laughs> Not, not governments necessarily, but other types of not for profits often have more of a functional type of presentation. You know, they'll have administrative versus program services, and that sometimes is more meaningful to the public to see what the um, particular functions were they were doing, you know. And what we could do then in that regard is you do a synopsis of the statement of activities that's in the CAFR, which is kind of busy and complicated, but can be dialed into more of a functional area thing to show what's supported by revenues, specific revenues, and how much of different things are supported by, by general revenues like taxes. So, yeah. But if we, if we could get a, you know, a, some sort of thought process moving forward on a pro forma basis, uh, those figures could be used to help change thought process about the future of the city. Uh, you know, everybody thinks real estate taxes will recover and blah, blah, blah. Money comes in easy. Well, it doesn't come in easy. And uh, if you sat down and just take the, uh, the, the budget today and said, okay, 
I'm going to go one and a half percent on revenue, right? Two percent on revenue, and I'm going to go three and a half on expenses. You would find quickly those lines merge across. Yeah, and they boom, they go like that. I mean, and the public would all of a sudden see. Wait a minute, we can't be raising payroll for the cost of running the city at three and a half percent when the revenue's coming in at two or two and a half or, or one, and and. And there's no cushion. I mean, so the pro forma statements, just like when we did businesses, yeah, they weren't always right, but they at least gave us a, you know, where we were in the water. <laughs> so I, if we could, that'd be ideal. I don't know if we can. But. Well, I think looking at this simplified and coming up with one of those might, might really help in that area. I think that's a great first step, at least something that, can be distributed that is not going to have people throw their hands up, but be able to, you know, just go through some of the, and then from there begin to think about going forward yeah, with some trend lines and whatever. Five-year plan. You know, most simple. businesses have a five-year plan. You know? and, and I saw some of the best ones. I believe it was City of Houston's. You know, they even dispensed with, you know, statement of unrestricted net assets. They they, they cast it as what we have and what we owe. You right. know, what we have, and it was cash in the bank, investments, what right. we owe. Here's our liabilities. It was very, very straightforward and very user-friendly, and, and uh, I thought it might be really useful for the public. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll give but it a Particularly when you get into this, that a, a negative cash balance is great. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, trying to go through that drives you crazy, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I took a pretty big swipe year before last at the five-year capital programs and, and redid them in, in terms of those spreadsheets that show the balances forward because before it was always in a vacuum of what was in the fund and then it was all backfilled with borrowing that we never did. Um, and and hopefully down the road I'm going to do the same with the, this, this budget presentation because I really think it needs to just show <clears throat> beginning fund balance revenues yeah. Well, expenditures and ending fund balance instead of that minus plus number that confuses everybody. So, in a sense, you're already doing it because you got the capital expenditure program planned out for five years. So, the yep. theory is you, you've already done that. So, you have to match it up on, on a cash flow basis. Yep. So, in a sense, the the foundation is there to do it. And, 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 and even if it's done in bulk figures, it would at least have the public being able to see that if we match this up, a small chart would begin to help, you know. Well, no, and and as, that's your point, is that as, as you have to replenish your reserve funds and where your trend lines go, are you replacing them? And if you're not, what are you going to do? And then yeah. cut services or raise taxes or both? Because at the end of the day, you know, and we talked about this briefly, that Gasby actually tried to promulgate a, a requirement that governments do exactly that kind of forward-looking five to ten year pro forma in their CAFR as part of the statistical section. And the GFOA just, you know, lost their minds because, it, first of all, to put something like that in an audited financial yeah, statement implies right. that in some way you can audit the future. Mm -hmm. But but more importantly, you know, the real argument that you get into is what are the assumptions? Are you going to assume that the property taxes increase? I mean, at the end of the day, as a government entity, no matter what happens, when we get to each year in Individually, we are required to adopt a balanced budget by law. So, you know, you can do that forecast, but when six years from now comes, that year has to be taken as its own individual year. Sure. And at the end of September, you have to come up with a budget that's balanced and, and do something. Increase revenues, lower expenses, something. Well, thank so, God for um, that. Man. <laughs> In trouble, real trouble. So. Well, except that in fairness, there's some funny stuff going on in the balance sheet, too. I mean, just like you said, I mean, I, <laughs> you admitted it, and we all know it. some figures aren't in the operating statement, and that's clear. Now, Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, the OPEB. I mean, to me, that's the biggest frustration. And, and one of the things we've done or I've done to kind of tackle that is I, I think the first and only OPEB actuarial valuation that we had done here at the city was pretty – pretty rudimentary and not particularly great. So um, I engaged last year through RFP the services of an OPEB actuary that's extremely qualified not only to do a really good actuarial valuation, but also maybe to help us find our way through the um, through the weeds here as we change our accounting um, you know, methods and maybe try to do some things to sort of dial that back um, after we tackle the pension. So um, we should be having much better information and, and better discussions on that front hopefully in the coming year as these guys begin to help 
us with that. We have done some things, you know, moving from self-insured to, to fully insured, I think is going to have a big impact on, on that actuarial evaluation in a positive way. But there are other things we can do. Cindy, I, I want to make sure, make sure it's clear. I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. You guys have been through some major wars for the last two or three years. And you've done a profound job of, of, of handling it and mitigating it. And it shows in the financial statements of the city. So, I mean, our hats are off to you. At least my hats are off to you. Oh, thank, right. thank, thank you very much. But it really is a team effort. I, if, if we were not able to get the department directors to really come on board with this, we would be still fighting through the, the woods. But uh, I, I think the department directors understand the seriousness of what we're doing. They bought into the way we're going to do it. And, uh, and I think we're, as a, as a group, going to make it. Still takes good leadership, and you've been good leaders. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, I endorse that because uh, I go back three years on the commission and uh, looking at the night and day change, as you were pointing out. You know, even as we began to rudimentary uh, make contribution, I'm sure you have as well, uh, Tammy, that there's, there's no comparison. I mean, you'd get one page of paper, and that was... <laughs> You know your analysis. So. We've solved that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you have a great, great deal of transparency and, and a great deal of patience and really, you know, explaining all the details we ask about. Uh, any members matters? When you what? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it, members matters is the next and, and last on the uh, uh, agenda. If not, do I have a motion to? I make a motion for a closing meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you.